Hey everybody, welcome back. CC Bell here with, believe it or not, our final installment of these deep dive videos into the world of El Defo. Ooh, it's glowing. The sun is shining. It looks enchanted. <laughs> anyway, I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving and now you're gearing up for yet another holiday season and I hope that that one will be lots of fun for you also. And hopefully you're still being careful and staying healthy and safe and all that good stuff. But we have a lot to talk about today, chapter 21, and like I said, it is the very last chapter. Wow, Whew. I can hardly believe it. Chapter begins on page 222, which is very interesting because Martha Clater's birthday, my Martha from this book, her birthday is February the 22nd. So 222, just like the last page, I'm sorry, the first page of the last chapter of El Defo. Isn't that cool? Woohoo! But in that first panel on this page, you can see that I really feel like part of the group now. I'm sort of in the middle of the group. Gone is the bubble of loneliness. I'm not lonely anymore. I'm feeling kind of accepted now. And this is a very exciting moment for me. And you'll see that we are talking about putting some music on during our party. And Jenny is actually holding a 45. And hopefully some of you, maybe all of you, know that a um, 45 is one of the little records for your record player. Hopefully you know what records are. Oh my gosh. And each side of a 45 has one song on it. And so a lot of us growing up in the 70s, this is how we listen to music. And my favorite 45 when I was real little, on one side was a song called The Bunny Hop. And I think probably a lot of you know that song, and I'm hoping that I can get away with playing a little bit of it here. And on the other side of the 45 was a song called, um, I believe it was called, Charlie Has an Apple on His Stick. I think it was Charlie. Somebody has an apple on his stick and I want one too. That was how it went. Charlie had an, or Charlie has an apple on his stick. Apple on his stick, apple on his stick. Charlie has an apple on his stick and I want one too. That was my country version of it too. So that was my favorite 45 when I was about four, three or four years old. But then, of course, we grow up and our um, musical tastes change. And so by 1979, 1980, myself and all my classmates were very much into the rock band Queen. And so Jenny says, I brought my Queen record. We can play it today during Quiet Mass. And though I don't think this specifically happened just like this, um, I did reference the Queen record because in the fifth grade, our teacher let us have an actual party, a real party, and we were allowed to bring 45s with us to school so we could play music. And the one I remembered the most was that somebody brought a, um, I'm blinking like crazy. I got something in my eye. Oh, I got something in my eye. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> is that, is that you? <laughs> um, where was I? Oh yeah, so everybody got to bring 45 and the, um, somebody brought 
a 45 of Queen. And if you don't know who or what Queen is, Queen was a, a big, epic rock band from the 1970s. Four people in it. The most famous member, member was um, Freddie Mercury. And you talk about epic. <laughs> so the songs on this 45 that I remember from this actual party at school, on one side was Another One Bites the Dust, and on the B side, there was always A side, B side. And on the B side, I'm pretty sure, was either We Are the Champions or um, We Will Rock You. Great songs. And so I just remember all of us standing in a circle and boogieing to Queen. So that's why Queen gets mentioned. And I've barely just begun. Good grief. I have a whole chapter to go. And I'm just... Wah, wah, wah. Anywho, anywho, we decide we're doing it again, and I had so much fun doing it that I wasn't scared anymore. I was excited. However, the whole plan down the drain because Mrs. Finkelman says, Class, we're doing something special today. So you'll be happy to hear that this means there will be no quiet math. Ah, my goodness, I had no idea that you all enjoy quiet math so much. How lovely. Of course, you know, we enjoy quiet math now because um, that's when we can have our parties. But um, I don't think we actually enjoyed it for doing the math. So, that's page <laughs> 222 and we'll go on to page 223 and the reason that we're not having quiet math is because Mrs. Catawba who is the guidance counselor she is coming to our classroom to um, have to make a presentation and Mrs. Catawba in real life her name was Mrs. Gabala and she was the one guidance counselor for the whole entire elementary school. And Mrs. Gabala, the real guidance counselor, she really loomed large in my life because um, I think she saw me as a sort of a special case, somebody that she needed to look out for. And um, she was always concerned about my mental health because I think she probably was sensitive to the fact that I felt different and I was different. But um, instead of accepting that kind of help, I just, you know, talk to the hand, Mrs. Gabala. And that was just the kind of kid I was. I didn't want that kind of attention because I was afraid that... Um, it just amplified how different I was, if that makes sense. But she really was a very kind, good intentioned person. Um, very lovely. But anyway, Mrs. Caballo shows up in the book as Mrs. Catawba. And in real life, this scene, this whole warm fuzzies part of the book, this really did happen, but it happened in third grade, not fifth. Again, um, a lot of the stuff at the very end, even though it seems like it happened in fifth grade, actually happened in third. So, she introduces us to this book called T.A. for Tots. And it was a book that was very popular in the early 70s. And some of my friends actually owned it. So, I was already aware of it when Mrs. Catawba showed up and said... Here's my favorite book, T.A. for Tots. And I actually really despised the book. I did not like it one bit. And, oh, But before I say why, the book um, was written by someone named Alvin M. Freed. And I guess he was a psychiatrist, maybe. And the T.A. stood for something called Transactional Analysis. Who knows what that means? But basically, the book was, um, I think it was another good intention thing. It was trying to teach kids how to speak about their emotions, 
It was trying to give them the language to talk about how they were feeling so that they could be helped. Very good intentions, but I was very, very prickly about anything that I thought was corny. And corny means, you know, like just, hopefully you know what that means without me explaining it. Cornball, just, you know, I don't know, corny. And, um, and I was just always prickly about that, um, sensitive to things that were trying too hard to help kind of thing. So you might remember in the chapter about TV where um, we're watching the ABC after school special. Uh, I, we watched that, that show just so we could make fun of how corny it was. That, that was just how I was. And my brother is a lot like that too. And I think I just wanted to impress my brother, and so I sort of learned how to be very sensitive to the corny stuff. So TA for Tots was extra corny because instead of teaching kids just to say, I'm happy or I'm sad, instead it taught kids to say stuff like, I need a warm fuzzy or I'm feeling like a cold prickly. No, happy sad. but. Anyway, anyway, I sort of um, go into this already disliking the book when I say groan. I've seen this book before. So corny. So just like I said, I really thought it was corny. And those last two panels on this page, those drawings in the background are lifted straight from the book. I basically just traced them. <laughs> and um, so the whole thing was illustrated. Um, they're pretty good illustrations, actually. The whole thing was illustrated and even the writing of it was done by hand. It was a very handmade looking book. So what does Mrs. Catawba, aka Mrs. Gabala, have to say? Here's how it works. If someone says something nice to you or gives you a hug, you feel good, right? That feeling is a warm fuzzy. But that feeling you get when someone is mean to you or hurts you, that's a cold prickly. Brrr. So, here's me rolling my eyes. Uh, whatever. So, TA for tops. And then on page 224, she announces that we get to make warm fuzzies. And what's cool about this chapter is what happened after the book came out, which is that um, a lot of fans of the book have sent me warm fuzzies that they've made. And that always makes me feel good. Even though at one time in my life I thought warm fuzzies were corny, I actually really love them now. <laughs> I'm a big old softy, just like, um, what was that? Um, Somewhere in Time, that movie from the sleepover chapter that I thought was corny. I love it now. So your taste can change as you grow up. But anyway, um, there's that panel that shows all of the supplies you need to make a warm fuzzy. So maybe that's partly why I've received so many warm fuzzies is because everybody knows what you need to make one. Um, so then we also get paper bags that we're supposed to personalize so that we can share the warm fuzzies with each other. And so Mrs. Catawba says, once you've made your bag and some warm fuzzies, you'll exchange fuzzies with your friends. You can keep your fuzzies in your bag and you'll feel good all day. Still pretty corny, but at least we get to make something. And isn't that the truth? Any time in school when you get to make something and it's not for art class. And when I was a kid, art class was like once every two weeks. I mean, almost never. And it might be that way for some of you too when you're actually in school. But um, anytime we got to make something outside of art class, that was the best day of all. Absolutely. So then, on page 225, I am going to read this page. I know exactly what to do with my bag. I get some yarn, 
some tape, and two old spools from the craft show. What a crazy couple of days it's been. I feel so different about a lot of things, about Mike and Martha, my neighbors and my classmates. I even feel different about the phonic ear. Voila, the phonic ear bag. And on the back, a top secret picture of me. And I don't say a picture of El Defo, I say a picture of me because I finally see myself as El Defo. And this page is sort of all about feeling like I'm accepted by other people and I'm actually accepting myself. And this will sound kind of like TA for tots and kind of corny, but it is true that a good way to be accepted by other people is to accept yourself. You kind of have to love yourself for other people to love and like you. So anyway, that's, um, that's my Dr. Phil moment for this video. Hooray. Um, so the bag looks like the phonic ear on one side, kind of. And I didn't actually do this particular thing with my bag um, back in the third grade, but the year before that, for Valentine's Day, we had to make those Valentine's Day boxes um, that we all use to collect Valentine's from. And maybe you've done that at school too. But um, the teacher then in the second grade said, make a Valentine's box that represents you in some way. And I actually made my box so that it looked like the phonic ear. So that is what this um, whole bag thing is based on. I sort of combined the Valentine's Day box with the warm fuzzies thing and turned it into this moment. So moving along. Oh, it was a cool box too. It really looked like the phonic ear and I even had old cords and actual earpieces from a previous hearing aid that my parents had kept and I stuck those to the sides. I wish I still had that. That was pretty funny. I thought it was funny. So, page 226. Mike comes over. Ooh, Mike, he likes me now. Mike comes over and he shows me what he has drawn on his bag. And what he has drawn is the Van Halen logo. Oh, man. Van Halen was a very, very popular band in the late 70s up to now. I mean, it has been popular forever, but their big heyday, in my mind, was in the 1980s. And the timing of this, of him drawing the Van Halen logo on his bag, is actually a little off, because here it's supposed to be about 1979 or 1980, and the Van Halen, the big Van Halen years were probably from about 82 on. So um, Van Halen um, was a band consisting of Eddie Van Halen, that was his last name, and he was this child prodigy who, who grew up to become an incredible guitar player, and I think his brother was the drummer, and their lead singer was this um, really good entertainer named David Lee Roth, and there were there's probably somebody else that I'm missing, but they were a big deal. And Eddie Van Halen actually died earlier this year, which I was very sad about because Van Halen was a big part of my childhood. But back then, however, if you look at panel three, when he shows me the Van Halen logo, here's what I think to myself. Van Halen, that crummy rock group, what happened to him liking the Beatles? Van Halen? Maybe we'd be better off just friends. So, um, or being, yeah. Maybe we'd be better off being just friends. So, not a fan of Van Halen back then. They were too much for me. So, and I have to admit, I don't know much about Van Halen now, but I do have a, um, respect for them because you know they were they were talented people and anyway I think it's also funny that I would dismiss Mike 
the crush that I've had for some time now, I would just completely dismiss him based on this one little thing. Good grief. Not very nice. But then, however, he steals my heart again um, when he shows me what's on the other side of the bag, which is that he is calling his warm fuzzies warm fuzzies. He's not planning to make warm fuzzies. He's going to make things that look like worms. And he and another classmate named J.P. Powell, who became my crush after Mike moved away, <laughs> had a lot of crushes. Um, J.P. Powell was in on the warm fuzzies thing too. They did it together and I thought that was hilarious. And I watched them make their warm fuzzies with a little bit of envy. But again, I wasn't the kind of kid who um, looked for trouble or got in trouble. So I made my warm fuzzies the right way. <laughs> anyway, anyway, um, Mike loves the bag that I show him. Everything's good, it's all good. And then on page 227, I'm going to read this page. I'm gonna make a lot of these things cause I wanna give away a lot. Hey Jenny, can I use your scissors? This one's my favorite. Maybe I'll keep it. 20 minutes later. Alrighty everyone, leave your bags on your desk, grab your fuzzies and start sharing some good feelings. I try to put a warm fuzzy in as many bags as I can. And I'm thinking, grab your fuzzies. <laughs> cause that does sound funny. And I make sure to put one in Jenny's bag. She may bug me sometimes, but she really is a good friend. I need to be nicer to her. And in Mike's bag too. I hope no one's looking. So I do remember this day so well, walking around the classroom, trying to decide um, where to put your warm fuzzies, who to give them to. And then on page 228, I'm very excited to find out that I did receive quite a few warm fuzzies. Um, really excited about that. And I definitely got a warm fuzzy from Mike. Yay! And I think his warm fuzzies were made just out of the felt that we got. And he just cut little worms out of, out of the felt and stuck eyes on them and had a warm fuzzy. So I was very happy about the worm fuzzy. And then Mrs. Catawba suggests that we re-gift them during the day because that will help spread the joy. And she was definitely right about that. Um, when you give a gift to somebody, it feels really good, especially something that you've made. So the final panel on this page, re-gift. I'm keeping this one the warm fuzzy, even if he does like Van Halen. So again, kind of dismissive, but I still like him very much. I am keeping that warm fuzzy. So page 229, um, this is just me realizing that Mrs. Catawba was right. These warm fuzzies are making me feel great. And that first panel shows me with the um, eating lunch and looking very happy and surrounded by people and feeling accepted. And we're all eating our delicious school lunches, which I really liked actually. I liked the pizza boats and I liked always having chocolate milk at lunch. Mmm, maybe not the healthiest, but delicious. And the rest of this page is basically um, me making peace with all of my enemies, like Mr. Potts, and I give a warm fuzzy to Laura. Um, the book is ending, and I wanted to end it. Even the more um, difficult relationships, I wanted to even end those on some kind of up note instead of just let them be forgotten forever. So that's why they sort of return here. And then the day ends, I'm back on the bus, and then finally, 
finally, finally, Martha sits down next to me on the bus. Yay! And you might remember from my conversation with the real Martha Crater, we talked about the fact that, yes, we had this conversation that takes place on page 230 and 231. We did have this conversation in real life, but it was when we were adults, and it was actually just before I really started working on this book. So I always thought that was kind of neat that I could still use this conversation we didn't really all the way make up until we were adults. I mean, we did, but we had never talked about it because probably because I was the kind of kid that rolled my eyes at TA for tops. I didn't want to talk about my emotions and I didn't want to talk to the guidance counselor about my problems. So why would I talk to Martha about all this? But as an adult, I could and I did. And that's what the conversation on page 230 and 231 is about and we make up we're we're total friends again and we even at the end of um page 231 we even pinky swear it yay for the pinky swear and i am so lucky to have had martha in my life for so long what a gift it is to still be friends with somebody after all these years and I hope that lots of you, that all of you, get that kind of friendship at some point in your life. Somebody who you feel like you will be friends with forever and you will trust forever. And she is way up there for me. So, the final two pages of El Defo. We have a big hug after the pinky swear. And then I say to Martha, okay. I think it's finally time to tell you all about El Defo. Who? El Defo and her true friend, you. So that ending, El Defo or me, I'm talking to Martha and I am saying her, you know, El Defo's true friend is you, meaning Martha. But I also very much meant for it to mean you my readers. Um, I wanted you to feel like through the course of reading this book that you became my friend as well. That if we met, we would be friends. And I think we would. And um, I think by, by showing you so much of my life and the fact that you took the time to read it and that those of you who are watching these videos, that you're taking the time to watch me now, that makes us friends, I think. And so that last word, you, that's you. As much as it is Martha, it is also you. So that is the book. Can you believe it? Whew. And before we finish the whole kit and caboodle, the afterword at the end of the book, sometimes you look at those afterwards or sometimes they're called forewords if the writer has written something beforehand. But this is the afterword. And sometimes, you know, you're like, ah, oh, that's too much fine print. I'm done with the book. I don't want to read anymore. But to me, the afterword is very, very important. And I spent a lot of time thinking about it and writing it and rewriting it and thinking about it some more and rewriting it again. I really needed to get it just right. And the overall gist of that afterward is just it was a way for me to explain that this particular story is about my own personal experience with deafness and i needed to make sure that people understood that every deaf person has a different experience they can be similar but they're still different and that it is good to acknowledge that anyone that has a disability has a different, um, a different experience of that disability, a different set of circumstances around that disability, and a different way of approaching life and approaching that disability. 
and there is no right or wrong way to deal with one's own disability. So this is my own personal story and it's not, it's not a blanket statement about deafness in general, obviously. And a good example of that is my attitude as a kid about sign language. That was, you know, that's a very specific attitude that I no longer agree with at all and would be very, very different from another deaf person's experience who loved sign language and loved it as a kid because it was everything to them. So all that kind of thing. And the one thing I want to leave you all with is a new term that I learned recently and it is used in um, sports, um, especially when talking about uh, disabled athletes and the word and I love it is adaptive and what that means is that the athlete adapts um, different things maybe um, maybe it's somebody who adapts their wheelchair to better play basketball that kind of thing or but it doesn't necessarily have to refer to technology or um, assistive devices it just means that people with disabilities are really good at adapting, adapting to their situation and adapted to, adapting to um, what's going on in that moment. They're really good at that. And that is our superpower, is being able to adapt. And so, adaptive. I think that word is every bit as good as the word disability to describe us as a group. Um, maybe even better. I mean, it's just such a positive word. I'm adapting. <laughs> so, <laughs> what are you doing? I'm adapting. <laughs> anyway, anyway, that is it. And thank you so much, all of you who have read the book, who have sent me nice letters and artwork over these years, and and also big thanks to all of you who have watched all of these videos. I hope that you've enjoyed them and gotten something good out of them. And um, I really do thank you. So, yay! Um, hopefully at the end of the year, um, or at the beginning of next year, things will be looking up. Um, maybe we'll have those vaccines and we will all be able to go back out into the world and give each other a big old massive hug. That's my dream. So I hope to see you someday and thank you very, very much once again. I'll talk to you later. Bye.